In 1989, a 34-year-old Warren Spector landed a job at Origin Systems. He served as producer on several PC classics like Wing Commander, Ultima Underworld, System Shock, and more. In January of 1993, he began planning Troubleshooter, a first-person action game in the vein of Ultima Underworld, starring an ex-cop security specialist. It was a dream project of his, but Troubleshooter never entered production, and Spectre soon left Origin. After working together with Looking Glass Studios on several projects, he left Origin to accept a new position as general manager of the Looking Glass branch in Austin, Texas. Spectre continued his work on Troubleshooter, which was renamed Junction Point, but he still could not get the game in production. Then, John Romero, one of the creative minds behind Doom, persuaded Spectre to join his newly created studio, Ion Storm. It's there, the development on Spectre's dream truly got off the ground. Romero promised a big marketing budget, and no creative interference. Spectre told Game Developer Magazine in November of 2000 that he'd been thinking about the game since Ultima Underworld 2 had shipped in 1993. We were inspired by games made at Valve, Origin, and a host of other places. Many of the things we wanted to do were a reaction to things they or we didn't do, didn't do well, or couldn't do at all in earlier games. We weren't building from scratch, but rather building on a foundation already laid for us. Despite Spectre laying the groundwork and building on ideas from Troubleshooter and Junction Point, the project was a collaborative effort. There were approximately 20 full-time developers, three programmers, six designers, seven artists, one writer, one associate producer, and one technician. IonStorm also employed six part-time contractors, two additional writers, and four testers. This was all of us working on this stuff together, lead programmer and assistant director Chris Norden said in a GameSpot gameplay video. Everybody's ideas came together, and it was constant feedback from everybody on the team, regardless of their role. It was this collaboration and emphasis on player choice that drove development. Spectre said, The game was conceived with the idea that we'd accept players as our collaborators, that we'd put power back in their hands, ask them to make choices, and let them deal with the consequences. They wanted to avoid contrived moments they had experienced in other games where problems had predictable solutions, or were solved by higher power. As a statement against this primitive storytelling method they were leaving behind, Spectre renamed the game a third and final time to Deus Ex. The team sought to combine elements from multiple genre types, including first-person shooters, RPGs, and adventure games. It's a first-person shooter because the action unfolds in real time, seen through the virtual eyes of your alter ego in the game world, Spectre said. It's an adventure game in that it's story-driven, linear in narrative structure, and involves character interaction and item accumulation to advance the plot. And it's like an RPG in that you play a role and make character development choices that ensure that you end up with a unique alter ego. At the early stages of development, there were two separate design teams that focused on differing philosophies, an RPG group and an immersive sim group. I thought I could manage the tension between the groups and that the groups and game would be stronger for it. My plan didn't work, Spectre admitted. I finally merged the groups, and despite some disappointed folks, the game was better for it. These early stages were plagued with humbling moments. We built some test missions, Spectre said. These revealed gaping holes in our thinking, or things that we thought would be true, and which turned out not to be true at all. Valve released their landmark shooter Half-Life in the winter of 1998. Half-Life's story didn't rely on cutscenes and was told entirely through scripted events, never breaking the player's first-person view. The crowbar found in the beginning of Deus Ex is a direct homage to Gordon Freeman's favorite melee weapon. Spectre recalls, When Gabe Newell from Valve came down and played our prototype missions, he correctly identified the utter lack of tension in our skill and augmentation use. Other friends from Looking Glass Studios and Irrational Games came to the same conclusion. We took this criticism, and with it in mind, lead designer Harvey Smith revised the skill and augmentation systems pretty thoroughly, increasing the tension level, providing new rewards, and allowing players to think and make informed decisions. 
Harvey Smith, who most recently co-directed Dishonored, was lead designer of the project and wholly believed in the philosophy of less is more. In the end, Spectre said, we cut a lot, left a lot, and made a game that everyone on the team was happy with. I think. Deus Ex was released in June of 2000 for Windows PCs. It arrived on the Mac shortly after and was ported to PlayStation 2 in 2002. The game takes place in a cyberpunk-themed dystopia where ancient organizations like the Illuminati, Triads, and other influential leaders vie for control of the world. Ion Storm did a vast amount of research on popular conspiracy theories like the Kennedy assassination, Area 51, the CIA pushing crack in East LA, and Dwight Eisenhower's UFO connection, giving the team a peek into the minds of real-life theorists. Don't tell me you're going to wear those sunglasses during a night operation. My vision is augmented. The player controls J.C. Denton, an agent for the United Nations Anti-Terrorist Coalition, on his first night of field duty. It's my first day too, I'm pretty excited. Nanotechnology is about to become the next evolution in human augmentation. Equipped with this powerful nanotech, which is only available to a select few, J.C. begins his mission in New York. Unaware, he's being carefully watched and manipulated from the shadows. It was my error to believe that a Unatka super weapon would appreciate the chance to prove himself. Just give me the next objective. The world was recently hit with a global pandemic known as the Grey Death, a deadly virus secretly created by the shadowy organization Majestic 12. Their public subsidiary VersaLife produces both the virus and its vaccine Ambrosia, which is being sold for astronomically high prices to the rich and powerful. This has led to widespread rioting and civil unrest, while giving Majestic 12 increased political influence. You'll be well rewarded. Trust me. Before the game begins, the player is given 5,000 skill points to spend on 9 available skills. These allow each player to tailor their experience throughout the game and dictate the way they interact with the world. From lockpicking, electronics, and environmental training to more straightforward weapon skills like heavy weapons and pistols, these dramatically dictate the way the player has to think. The goal of Deus Ex is to let you apply real-world logic to solving video game problems. Good thinking. You might be able to avoid some of the security by entering this way. Additional skill points are earned for accomplishing various goals and side quests. If a player decides to invest solely into weapon skills, they'll be able to destroy any opposition with relative ease. Hacking-oriented players may be able to bypass security doors and use shortcuts, but should try to avoid combat whenever possible. It's up to the player to determine how to complete their objectives with the information they obtain, whether it's through direct conversations with other characters, hacked emails, or by actual eyes-on reconnaissance. NPCs scattered around the game's spacious environments can deliver critical information regarding secret entrances to bases, or offer much-needed supplies for credit chits, the in-game currency. Alternate paths offer unique ways into enemy strongholds, and saying the right thing to an NPC may yield varying rewards or information. Minimum force won't work in the city. You better take some hardware. <laughs> Of course, more aggressive players may be inclined to skip the questioning. A variety of lethal and non-lethal melee weapons and firearms can be picked up and upgraded throughout the adventure. Certain characters may react differently towards JC depending on the way he handles specific situations, either as a silent pacifist or a cold-blooded killer. Nano augmentations offer another layer of customization. There are 18 available upgrades, but only 9 may be installed, so each player has to develop their own playstyle. Combat strength increases melee power. Run Silent muffles your footsteps, and JC Spy Drone emits an EMP blast. Some AUGs are easily found, while others are well hidden. Each can be upgraded up to three times with rare canisters that can make them extremely powerful. Coupled with the skill system, augmentations add yet another layer of freedom to let each player imprint JC with the abilities and skills of their choosing. Get out of here, Denton. This is none of your business. 
the player may encounter choices they don't realize are choices at the time. When JC's brother Paul is in danger, JC journeys to meet him in New York at the Ton Hotel. Paul's kill switch is activated, sending UNATCO troops and the men in black to assassinate him. As Paul yells for JC to escape out of the back window, powerful soldiers storm the room. Listening to JC's brother and leaving him behind leads to Paul's death. The game doesn't overtly tell the player to save Paul, but if you fight through the swarm, Paul lives and reunites with JC in Hong Kong. Go, you don't have much time. This isn't the only subtle moment of extreme consequence. While in Paris, an odd mechanic seems nervous when confronted. To make things even more mysterious, a dead corpse lies behind a stack of boxes. Missing these small details has dire repercussions, as JC's trustworthy ally Jock soon dies from a bomb planted in his helicopter. Killing the shady mechanic instead saves Jock's life. I got you this opportunity. Now it's up to you. The globetrotting adventure brings players to New York, Hong Kong, California, Paris, and Nevada. Each of these locations evokes different emotions and offers a unique look at the world. New York is in a state of decay due to rebel terrorist attacks and the spread of Grey Death. Bums and the destitute are common in places like Hell's Kitchen and Battery Park. Hong Kong has fared slightly better thanks to its own autonomous government, but is the victim of a violent triad war, while Paris is under martial law. Eventually, JC is led to the mother of all conspiracy theories, Area 51. It's here where all the major choices made throughout the game culminate. After overcoming the many obstacles inside of Area 51, JC is contacted by Tracer Tong of the Triads, Morgan Everett of the Illuminati, and the artificial intelligence Helios. Each of them attempts to persuade JC into doing their bidding. Tong wants the global communications hub destroyed, thereby plunging the world into a second dark age. Everett promises to rule the world with a guiding hand from the shadows. Finally, Helios wants to merge with Denton and become an all-powerful benevolent ruler. If Paul survived New York, he'll tell JC to follow his conscience. Depending on the way the player has progressed through the game, this final choice is in their hands. It's here that philosophical, religious, and emotional beliefs collide, forcing the player to make a decision that reflects their journey. See how easily our technologies turn on us? The more power you think you have, the more quickly it slips from your hands. Deus Ex remains an influential game over a decade later. Its grounded, real-world narrative contains elements that have actually come true since the game's launch. This, combined with several meaningful player choices, has guided new players to the franchise. The legacy continues to surprise Warren Spector. If you told me anybody was going to care about any game for 15 years, I would have said you were nuts. I get emails from people all the time that say they are still playing it. Deus Ex was ultimately a triumph. Some reviewers felt that the difficulty level of every path available to the player was not equally balanced, but by the end of 2000, it had garnered several Game of the Year awards. In the years since, Deus Ex has secured several spots on various top 100 games lists, and is frequently referred to as one of the best, if not the best, PC game of all time. In August of 2000, Ion Storm's parent company, IDOS Interactive, purchased the rights to the two-year-old Thief franchise, originally developed by Looking Glass Studios. This was around the same time Ion Storm Austin was wrapping up Deus Ex. Spectre decided to step down as director of the second Deus Ex to work on the next Thief project instead. Lead designer Harvey Smith stepped in to fill Spectre's shoes.
On December 2nd, 2003, Deus Ex Invisible War was released simultaneously on the PC and Microsoft's Xbox. The core strategy for the sequel was to build upon the strengths of the original, while fixing the areas that received criticism. While the first Deus Ex was developed for the PC, the second was built from the ground up for the Xbox, and later ported. Because of this decision, environment size was scaled back, and the compact zones were separated by even more loading screens. The skill point system from the first game, which helped uniquely define each player's character as their own, was replaced by a biomod system, and a greater emphasis on weapon upgrades. It's a little late for a seminar on my biomod architecture. Biomods activate abilities that correspond to one of five aspects of the human body – arm, cranial, eye, leg, and skeletal. Each region has three different, mutually exclusive options, like regeneration, which heals Alex over a short period of time, or vision enhancement, a short-ranged flashlight that's great for lighting up the game's darker areas. There are also black market upgrades for certain biomods, like Neural Interface, which grants Alex the ability to hack electronic devices like computers or security cameras. The best mods are black market, attack drones, bot domination. This will add value when I go back to the corporate market. Some biomods are much too powerful compared with others. Thermal masking makes Alex invisible to bots and electronic devices, making it easy to avoid some of the game's tougher enemies. Missions play out similar to the original Deus Ex. You can try to be subtle with one of Invisible War's melee weapons, like the Energy Blade, or rush in with a rocket launcher. Freedom of choice again carries over to the story. One of the black market harvesters wants Alex to kill the security chief in Cairo. If you kill him, you'll be rewarded by the dealer, but if you let him live, the security chief offers you his own reward. The game continued the storytelling tradition, but unlike the original adventure, none of these decisions have a big impact on the story until near the end. You may purchase now, or an additional discount by providing another service to the Omar. Go on. Every society has rules. But armed guards at a nightclub? No business can prosper without protection against crime. Invisible War takes place in the year 2072, 20 years after Deus Ex. Instead of picking just one ending as canon, the story follows a combination of the original's three endings. In this world, J.C. Denton merged with Helios, destroyed Area 51, and caused an apocalyptic event called the Collapse. Taking advantage, the Illuminati seized control through two separate groups, the World Trade Organization and the Order Church. The WTO upholds the Illuminati's capitalist stronghold, and the Order Church enforces its ideals from a variety of religions while battling the WTO. Invisible War's protagonist, Alex D, is a member of the Tarsus Academy, a school for education and training in a number of elite careers. Alex's facility is evacuated after a terrorist attack destroys the city of Chicago. Biomodification is more involved than you might imagine, Alex. This facility was for your protection. His friend and classmate, Billy Adams, reveals that she belongs to the Order Church and asks Alex to join. Billy claims that Tarsus is using its trainees as test subjects in a biomodification program. After a series of missions, Alex discovers that members of the Order have defected to the Knights Templar, the ancient organization that prefers a more militant approach. They really want us to find true balance and order in our lives, which can only be possible when we're not being subjected to secret experiments. Over the course of the game, Alex goes on a series of missions for the Order, WTO, and a team of nanite researchers created by J.C. Denton called Apostle Corp. These missions take you to new destinations like Cairo and Trier, along with familiar spots like Liberty Island. While uncovering the Great Conspiracy, Alex and Billy discover they're clones of J.C. Denton. J.C., who aims to create a perfect global democracy through a bioengineered hive mind, was put into stasis after his body rejected an infusion of biomods. Each organization in the game wants to rule the world. Apostle Corp seeks to fulfill Denton's vision of the future. The Illuminati, who control the WTO and the Order, want to use Denton's technology to create a benevolent dictatorship. And the Templars want to eliminate biomodification entirely and create a holy and pure empire. 
During the finale of Invisible War, Alex can give his blood to the Templars to end biomodification, rescue JC's brother Paul, or kill Paul on orders from the Illuminati. During the final mission, Alex learns of a global communications protocol used by the Majestic 12 to control global networks called the Aquinas Protocol. Each faction wants Alex to upload this for their own use. Whoever gets the protocol ends the game. Be careful whom you trust. Only the Order can help you retain your individuality and find spiritual balance. All others are suspect. This one already told the other one from JC everything. Betrayal. This one was to be set free, but it was more lies and destruction. You are too valuable to us to be risking your life in foolish expeditions. Deus Ex Invisible War received good reviews and sold over a million copies, but it couldn't live up to its groundbreaking predecessor. This was largely due to a lack of synergy between sections of the development team, hardware limitations, and too much outside input. The sequel was noticeably shorter than the original, and many found the AI of the game's cast to be a bit behind. Not worth it. In 2007, Warren Spector invited Harvey Smith to talk to his class at the University of Texas for a course called Masterclass in Video Games and Digital Media. When speaking about Invisible War, Smith confessed, This was a very difficult game for me. We had bad team chemistry, we wrote the wrong renderer, we wrote the wrong kind of AI, and we shipped too early. It was also my first console game. And it is a different beast to work on a console game. You have no reason to hate us, Alex. Your enemies have occupied the island. I have no enemies, merely topographies of ignorance. Deus Ex Invisible War was a solid effort, but ultimately not the sequel fans were hoping for, failing to outclass other Xbox RPGs like Knights of the Old Republic. Warren Spector's Thief Project, called Deadly Shadows, launched in May of 2004. Soon after, Spectre announced he was pursuing personal interests outside the company, and left Ion Storm. The company closed its doors in 2005. The creators of Deus Ex moved on. Tune in next week for part two. A third development team gives the franchise new legs after a major corporation buys into the future of Deus Ex.